In this Research Methods podcast, we're going to be talking about statistics. Now, in an intro to stats, why am I using such an American-centric focus? Very simply, it's because statistics directs a lot of the decision-making that goes on in modern baseball team management, and in a business that's worth over $9 billion annually, it has impact. But if we think that stats are not being used everywhere, especially in business and communication-related decision-making, then quite honestly, we're fooling ourselves. But the thing is, baseball is a lot more fun to talk about than most big industries. So, in a lot of times when we're talking about sports, for any of the sports fans, questions will come up. Who's the best uh, at striker? If you're talking about football, who's the best goalkeeper? If you're talking about football, hockey, field hockey, a lot of different sports. So when we're sitting around talking about sports, there are debates that come up. In baseball, one of the common debates is who is the best batter? Now, one of the ways that we could say, you know, who's the best batter is by asking who has the best career batting average. Well, the answer to that is quite simple. You look at the numbers, and it's Ty Cobb from, from yester century he had a really big batting average. No, so he may be a bit of a challenged kind of guy, but there are other people who say, nah, he's not the greatest batter. There are a lot of other batters who might be better. So uh, one of the recently retired uh, baseball players in the U.S., Derek Jeter, had 3,000 hits, was known as a great baseball player, and especially great at getting on base. So how does he compare to someone that is recognized as one of the best batters in history? Well, one of the ways to think about this is how many hits did they have? There are only 28 players in the history of baseball who have ever hit more than 3,000 times on base. Derek Jeter's near the bottom of them since he just barely got to 3,000. Ty Cobb, you can see, is second from the top at 4,100. So the question is, how do you compare this? How does Jeter's accomplishment compare to these other 27 guys? Well, we can start taking a look at the numbers to try and figure out what might and might not reveal some more information about that. Most 3,000 hitters, for example have hit singles and doubles for the 3,000th hit. So one of the ways that we could ask the question, you know, how good is a baseball player, is by saying, who hit a home run as their 3,000th hit? Jeter did, so he clearly stands out because he had some power. But at the same time, is that necessarily the best way to look at it? The other question might be to ask, you know, who reached 3,000 hits the youngest? So this box and whisker plot shows the age at which each of the 28 joined the 3,000 plus club. Derek Jeter was on the younger side of it. He was between 36 and 37 when he hit his 3,000th hit. So again, he has power. He hit it younger, which suggests that he is probably a pretty darn good hitter. So then there's another way to take a look at it, it, which is the amount of time or the number of times they had an opportunity to bat in order to get to 3,000. Now, note some of the data for some of the players isn't known. But if we take a look, Derek Jeter had about 9,600. It's certainly not the lowest, but it's certainly not over 10,000 where a lot of these top players are. But if you compare Derek Jeter, for example, to Pete Rose... Pete Rose had another 1,200 or so hits on top of Derek Jeter and fewer times at bat to get there. So does this mean he's a better batter, a worse batter? How can we, how can we infer who's the best? All these could be potential reasons that he's the best. Another way to measure how good of a baseball player and a batter Derek Jeter was, was to ask how efficient of a hitter was he? So the more efficient, that means the more times out of 10 that he's going to be able to get on base. Now, coming at this from a baseball manager's perspective or from a team's perspective, you want to get players who get on base more consistently. The more people get on base, the more likely they are to score. So from a decision-making standpoint, this could be a good indication of how valuable a particular player was. In Jeter's case... He was on base approximately three, 
times out of 10. He's just slightly below the median, but otherwise he's still in the middle of the pack. You know, at this time, though, when this measurement was taken, he was still an active player. He had a chance to improve that, but to be honest, this is pretty much where he ended up once he retired. So, on average, for the best baseball hitters in the game, in history, he's pretty average. But that would suggest that he's a pretty good bet that if you're a manager and you wanted someone who is going to get on base and in the hopes of scoring runs, that would be someone that would be useful to have in, in play. But then in terms of lifetime batting average, Derek Jeter is above average. And again, since he's an active player, he could improve it. But again, he ended up right around here. But so what does this tell us? That so he's pretty average in his on-base percentage. He had a better than average amongst the very best um, batting average. So he's a really consistent hitter and offers, offers a baseball team something in return. But does this guarantee, then, that Derek Jeter would be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame? Well, statistically speaking, his chances are pretty good, since over 85% of the 3,000 club members are in the Hall of Fame, and one notable exception is Pete Rose, and he had some gambling issues that explain why he isn't there. Most of the others, it's based, based on the age at which they retired. So... If you're going to put odds on whether or not he was going to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame, eh, he probably wouldn't get much payout, to be perfectly honest about it. So, it's a safe bet. He's probably going to do that. But the question, you know, aside from some useless trivia about a game that most people don't pay attention to outside the U.S., what point is this? Well, in some ways, you never know when your knowledge is going to be tested. Beyond just a pub quiz or sitting around having a bit of chit-chat, what does baseball teach us about using statistics? Well, one of the ways that it teaches about using statistics is basically how it reshaped the game of baseball. Um, if you've seen the movie Moneyball, then you understand. The Oakland A's went from being a below average performing team to being in the World Series, the top of uh, the, the top tournament for baseball in the next year by being more efficient, by using the statistics to govern the player choices on the day and overall on their overall management. So how can we translate this into another kind of business setting into our research? Well, the backstory on this is helpful. Billy Bean, the manager that Brad Pitt plays, used a comprehensive statistical analysis to both challenge and change professional baseball in terms of draft choices, player analysis, game strategies, and the correlation of a player's stats to salary. It's, it's no understatement to say that he fundamentally changed the way that the business of baseball was conducted. And so in terms of draft choice matrix, it shifted from high school stars being evaluated on foot speed, throwing speed, and something so nebulous as big league looks, to college players with accumulated statistics and overall winning percentage. Now, if you put this into a more business context in public relations, you go from the sense of, well, you know, I've done this for 20 years and it's worked. Great but how does anyone else replicate that, to a decision-making calculus that's based on previous success and demonstrable return on investment. That's what this draft choice metric example is, metric example is really talking about, is making a more reasoned decision based on past performance. So major league player metrics shifted to on base percentage ahead of batting average and other old time metrics that were used. So then there was the question of, well, how much should these metrics correlate to salaries? Because their rankings on these metrics differed, it meant that early on in, in this shift in mindset, that quite frankly, smaller teams were able to better compete. So small money teams, because they could focus on getting the second tier players who were the most productive. They could reduce their overall expenditure on salary while maximizing the productivity. 
So in the UK, when we asked the question about Leicester, why did Leicester work? Well, it wasn't because, obviously, when they won um, the Premier League, it wasn't because they had the most flash players, but they worked as a team. It was a team that fundamentally pulled together with players who played in their roles really effectively. This is what this notion of managing sports teams using statistics to inform them is about. Likewise, in business sense, when you're talking about employees or when you're talking about marketing products, brands, and what have you, you want to go with the avenues for all of this that are the most cost effective. That's one of the reasons why we can show that a lot of impact has uh, in social media, driving social media, it's more cost effective, but it's also a lot of times much more effective in terms of the return on the investment. So then based on these intensive statistical analyses, they switched the emphasis in baseball to the on-base percentage and avoiding outs over traditional bunting, base stealing, different kinds of tactics. So it not only affected the decisions that were made in terms of personnel, but also in terms of performance. So outside of a sports context, we see this in terms of the, the development. The best example I can think of is the development of social media for customer service inquiries. People are talking on social media all the time and talking about the companies that they use, whether they like them, whether they don't like them. Actively engaging with people on social media as a customer service means that we're actually affecting folks where they're having the conversation instead of then having to have very slow reaction to a public sentiment that's emerging, it's possible to get out ahead of it. So this is really changing the way that organizations are playing the game. So if we think about the types of decision metrics, these kinds of updates are happening all the time. Now, the end of the story with the baseball league is in 2002, Oakland ended up having a significant gain. So take a look at their payroll. So they were, had the smallest payroll possible and yet the best win percentage. So if you think about it in dollars for win, they're a lot better value than anything else. And that's the point. It's about changing the decision calculus to ensure that they were more effective. Now, so what can baseball teach us about using statistics? Well, it's about inductive reasoning, evidence-based decision-making, identifying the reality that numbers are neutral, but decisions are not. Decisions are inherently value-based. And so the purpose of statistics is to describe and predict likely outcomes. So this is about how we think in an applied setting. So why should we use statistics? It's, the answer is pretty simple. We can improve our decision making. But if we want to decode quantitative analysis from the side of the research, I also have another pitch that across the business domain, whether we're talking management, marketing, public relations, retail, there are a lot of good jobs available and very few applicants in applied research jobs related to business marketing and PR people that need to be able to do quantitative analysis. So if you're thinking about employability, using numbers, having quantitative analysis on your CV can give you opportunities that you might not have otherwise had. And, and fair enough, you might say, I'm never gonna be a researcher, but what, so why should I learn this? Well, sometimes the question of what we wanna be and what we're going to fall into, we may not necessarily know where that's gonna take us. But regardless of whether or not you're ever going to be a researcher or do applied research, one of the realities is that you're going to come in contact with a lot of numbers when, when you're doing your work across any of the business, public relations, and marketing domains. It's helpful if you understand what's in the mindset of 
numbers, how you can reason with numbers. So what's in the mindset of people producing them? How can you take a number and then make a decision based on that? So as a research, as a piece of research in reading research and understanding research, it's quite helpful if you understand quantitative analysis. If we want to think about it at the most basic level, all statistics are our decision-making tools. It's reasoning. It's not doing maths. I am not a big fan of doing math for a whole host of reasons, most especially because I'm not great at doing computations. But that's what computers are for, and that's what statistical programs are for. For me, statistics are about good decision-making tools. So it can give us a good rationale for any kind of a decision that we're going to make. That is, it can tell us the likelihood that something has happened or will happen. In my field of crisis communication, one of the things that practitioners um, have started to, to complain about is that there aren't effective predictable models about what kinds of crisis response are better in what kinds of circumstances. So there needs to be more quantitative analysis in order to predict this kind of likelihood. Um, so it's about probability and chance. You know, what is the likelihood, if you're gambling, that you're going to land on the block 28? Honestly, if you knew that probability, you would never play roulette. But that's the whole point. In an organizational context, in a professional context, it lets you manage risk. So when we're talking about probability, it's the likelihood. And so we want to improve the likelihood that we can predict what will happen and reduce that it just happens by chance by accounting for more factors. So for example, if I have a campaign message and I know that this message is going to be really successful among women from 18 to 35, or for men from, say, 26 to 42, that means that if I want to have the best return on my investment, I'm going to want to target outlets for this message, ways of communicating it, and even people involved that fit those demographics. It lets me make decisions that are much more responsible for my organization and much more likely to be productive. This is where theory meets research, meets ac actual decision-making. So, improving the probability, decreasing our chance.